Good afternoon from the editorial board of BuildUp Portal. For the, for the ones who are attending a BuildUp webinar for the first time, welcome. For our returning audience, thank you for renovating your interest. Just a brief explanation of what is BuildUp. BuildUp is a collaborative platform in the field of energy efficiency in buildings. It is continuously updated and it represents one of the key sources of information on the topic of energy efficiency. You can register and become a member of the community, and you can also upload news, events, present a case study, results from our projects, and so on. I would like to invite you all to navigate the portal. In the Learn section, you will find all the podcasts of the past webinars, so it is possible to listen to all the previous presentations. At the end of this webinar, the link to the full presentation and the file to the PDF presentation will be made available in this section of the portal. It is a pleasure to host today's webinar entitled How to, uh, How to Operate and Use Building Services During the COVID-19 Crisis, which is organized in collaboration with RIVA, Federation of European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Association. I would like to invite you all to contribute and participate in this webinar. You can ask questions by typing in the box on the right side of the screen. They will be answered at the end after the presentations. Now I would like to present the agenda of today's webinar and introduce the panelists. First, Manuel Carlos Gamero de Silva, professor at University of Coimbra and vice president of RIVA, who will introduce the indoor air quality concept and the case study of COVID-19. Then Jarek Kurnitsky, professor uh, from Tallinn University of, Te of Technology and chair of uh, uh, TRC RIVA. We'll discuss uh, RIVA's guidance for preventing the spread of the coronavirus disease. Then Livio Mazzarella, professor from Politecnico di, di Milano and a RIVA fellow, will showcase the Italian COVID-19 guidance for reducing the diffusion risk of SARS-CoV-2. Finally, Jure uh, Bercek, researcher and project manager from the Institute for, Innov for Innovation and Development of University of Ljubljana, and Mobistyle expert will discuss people-centric approach, create lasting habits for threat mitigation. Now I would like to leave the floor to Manuel Carlos Camero da Silva. So please, we can start the session. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for Riva to participate in this uh, uh, webinar. And so uh, I'm starting and uh, of course now we have a crisis and we have a kind of a war. And uh, uh, so my presentation is mainly dedicated to uh, no better our enemy in this, in this war. Uh, so uh, we will like uh, uh, start uh, with uh, the dimensions of the, uh, the virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so as you, as you see here, we have a, a picture in the microscope of the virus and uh, the dimension of the virus is somehow uh, something between uh, 60 to 80 till 140 nanometers, which means uh, like 0 0.1 micron. And, uh, if it, we put a micron, here's like this dimension of this uh, circle we have here. And if, of course, if we multiply this by 1000, we will get uh, one millimeter. Uh, if, uh, okay, something, uh, you think this is a, a hair, and uh, the, the dimension of a hair is like 50 to 70 uh, micron. So the virus is uh, 600 times thinner than hair. On the other side, if we compare the virus with the molecules of uh, air, uh, typically nitrogen and oxygen, it is uh, like 300 times bigger. So it means that uh, if the, the virus is in the air, it may move without being disturbed by the impact of the uh, with the molecules of air, and typically when we are releasing, uh, we have a, 
uh, particles or droplets released uh, by an infected pe person. Uh, this is what we call uh, uh, PM. So PM means like the particulate matter uh, with a dimension uh, below a, a certain value. For instance, PM10 is uh, all the particles with less than uh, 10 micron diameter. So you see that in a, a PM uh, in PM particles we may have lots of the virus because the virus is this uh, small uh, black dot that I represent here. Okay, this is a PM1 and this is what we call a PM5, just to and we may have a diversity of uh, sizes in the droplets that are exhaled by by a person. Okay, this is uh, like the typical uh, particle that particles that we may have uh, in the indoor air and virus are here typically in the range between uh, 0 0.01 and 0.01 uh, micro and we have all the, the other particles bacteria are like one or two order of magnitudes bigger than virus here we have like the gas molecules and uh, Airborne particles are those who will be floating in the air and uh, typically till the size of uh, 10 micron, depending, uh, of course, on the initial velocity, the particles may be uh, floating in the air. And this, of course, has uh, some uh, importance as you, you will see. The, the particles are like uh, also classified uh, depending on the size uh, and how they are able to penetrate in the respiration system of, of people. And uh, really, the most uh, dangerous are the smaller, uh, smaller particles because they are able to penetrate uh, deeper and they can go even uh, to the alveoli. Okay, depending on the on the size, we may have different behaviors of the particles in the air. Uh, so the smaller particles, they are able to float. So they are what the, we call airborne particles. And this comes from the balance between the uh, aerodynamic and the, the uh, gravitational forces. So for smaller particles, aerodynamic forces are dominant. So they can stay uh, for hours uh, floating in the air. Particles and those are uh, smaller than 10 micron. In the range between 10 micron and 50 micron, uh, the particles are in a condition where the two types of forces are somehow uh, the same size. And thus, uh, they are able to have like horizontal, almost horizontal trajectories. And of course, uh, as a particle moving in the air, uh, starting the movement with some initial velocity, we we'll lose velocity uh, during the movement. Uh, the gravitational forces will uh, become dominant because the uh, aerodynamic forces will decrease with the velocity and so after some time they will fall down. And bigger particles uh, with more than 50 micron, uh, typically they fall at uh, one meter from uh, a distance within one meter from the, the emission point. And the, the, the next slide explains why it happens. Because the uh, aerodynamic coefficient of a sphere as this type of behavior, and this is the range where the sinks with small particles in the air uh, occur, uh, for instance, in, in the flows we have uh, indoor uh, our houses and, and so on. And so the smaller particles are more to the to the left. So in that case. Uh, aerodynamic forces are able to keep them because okay this is just this is the Reynolds number coefficient where we have a participation of the diameter 
So these are here we have uh, the small diameters and as the diameter is increasing, we are going uh, along this, this curve. And this is the reason why we have this type of, of behavior with smaller particles airborne and bigger particles falling down. And so uh, when we have some respiratory events, uh, what happens is uh, we are releasing different uh, particles with different sizes and with different number. So this is for uh, sneezing, uh, for coughing and for talking. And as you see, typically one half of the particles in terms of the, the size are able to become airborne and the other half uh, will fall will fall down and uh, here what we have is like the floating time depending on the size and as you see uh, with particles less than one micron or less than 0 0.5 micron we have very long times the particles may stay floating and the bigger particles, it's just a question of a few seconds before they they fall down. So this, uh, uh, okay, here, uh, this was a film, it was a, a person sneezing, but yes, this is a PDF, the film will not run, but uh, anyway, you, you may see here like the trajectories and the, let us say, the big number of particles that one person uh, is uh, releasing when, uh, for instance, sneezing. Uh, and so, depending on the, the size of the particles, we have like three transmission modes. Uh, okay, let us start by the big one, uh, the big particles. So, they will be deposited, they will contaminate the surfaces, creating what we call fomites. So it's uh, zones with a very high uh, potential to uh, contamination. And if someone touches this and after has some behavior were to touch the, uh, like the, the, the head, uh, the particles may penetrate. So the uh, susceptible host is like a fortress uh, with some weak points like the nose, the mouth, the eyes, some wounds in case people have some wounds. And uh, so we have a kind of a war and this is like a, a platoon of infantry trying to uh, conquer the fortress. The next particles are the, the middle one uh, between 10 and 50 micron and these are like uh, uh, missiles that are shoot it and try to uh, to hit the, the target uh, and so if they are able to to enter uh, they there is like a first fight between uh, the attackers and the defenders and so the, the, the main problem is is that we are facing an enemy which is able to multiply the number of these shoulders at the expense of the cells of the invaded person. So the virus, when it enters, it will multiply uh, uh, the number of the uh, virus uh, at the expenses of the uh, cells. And uh, so if it enters in a small number, it is possible to, uh, like the defenders, to win this first combat. Uh, in case it comes in a big number, it's more more difficult. And I think this is one of the main issues with this virus is that uh, it, it is able to multiply at a very strong rate. And so uh, we are uh, facing an enemy nowadays with a much bigger army than the preview in the previous cases. Okay, finally, we have the uh, what, what the small particles. And what happens is that they are uh, evapor the, the liquid phase of the particle is evaporating in the first moments. And so we have the drop, droplet nuclei 
and they stay uh, airborne and we may inhale. And these are like, in case of, of, of the war, it's like parachutes, uh, skydivers, like uh, uh, they are in the air. And it's quite difficult to fight against them. Or, okay, and here we have a table with the different measures that we have uh, to, uh, let us say, prevent this type of, of modes. So for airborne, we have masks, face shield and ventilation. For droplets, we have confinement and uh, distance, distancing. And for contact, it's mainly hygiene, disinfection and behavior. Okay, this is a simulation made by the team of Professor Yugu Lee from the uh, Technical University of Hong Kong. Uh, and so we have a person releasing particles from the different sizes uh, during a COT uh, uh, event. And so as we, here I put the, this information uh, together with two people at uh, what we call the safety distance of two meters. And as you see, the airborne particles are spread in such a way that it, there is no safety distance. So the safety distance of two meters is a meet. And uh, so what uh, we need is, we should, of course, be uh, using uh, masks, and the masks have two effects. Uh, okay, one effect is that they will somehow uh, protect uh, the uh, suscept susceptible host from the viral content in the air. And on the other side, uh, they will reduce the number and the, the, uh, and the particles in the air emitted by uh, one uh, potential infected person. Okay, finally, I have only a, let us say, a comparison between what happened with the three countries with the same number of habitants, and these countries uh, applied in a very different way the protective measures. So, the Czech Republic uh, used masks almost from the beginning and mandatory for everybody. And so they had confinement, distancing, and of course, everybody nowadays is having hygiene and disinfection and try to teach people about the best behavior to avoid transporting the particles uh, from the contact mode. In Portugal, we had droplets and contact masks that were not mandatory, and in Sweden, they were quite liberal. So uh, the shops are still open, Explanades are open, uh, gymnasiums are open. So, in my opinion, they are mainly protecting about uh, as regards contact. So, this is a, a paper I'm preparing with uh, two colleagues, uh, Professor Ivo Martinak from TTH in Sweden and Professor Karel Cabell from the Technical University of Prague. And if we analyze here the uh, so one of the indicators for us, the most comparable indicator is the number of people in intensive care units. And this was the 23rd of April. You see the numbers co comparing these three countries. And analyzing this data, it's possible like to have a breakdown of the probabilities of the transmission modes. And exactly on the contrary, what was uh, like uh, uh, being diffused by the uh, health authorities, airborne looks to be the most dominant mode uh, in the transmission of uh, this virus. Okay, so in conclusion, we have face-to-face uh, -face -to meetings should not be held, should, uh, we should avoid it, and in case we, we have to do it, everybody should be uh, wearing masks. Uh, and if someone goes outside, uh, he should be using a mask and, if possible, a face shield. Uh, and uh, uh, indoor spaces with uh, multiple human occupancy, and multiple is more than one. If we have uh, 
let us say, uh, it's not a big number of people because with uh, two people, we have a probability that uh, one of the person is infected. And so we should uh, ventilate with uh, outdoor air, 100% outdoor air, to decrease the viral concentration. And those who work in public space places should wear a mask and a visor because this is a question of probabilities. And what is important is the dose. So if we are more time exposed, we should be protected more than if we are less time exposed. Okay, and uh, so uh, here we have the information about a paper, but this was uh, previous distributed. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, so uh, I am Jarek Kurnitski and I will continue with next presentation. This is about um, RIFA guidance, how to operate the building um, services. And um, uh, so this guidance is prepared for uh, common buildings where only some very limited number of infected person, persons is expected. So this, the scope is not for healthcare or hospital buildings, but it is dedicated to, let's say, offices, school buildings, shopping areas, uh, sport premises and, and so on. And um, this guidance is aimed to supplement the general guidance already provided by WHO, which is also well available in the web pages. But this RIFA guidance, uh, this is um, you can easily find from RIFA website. Uh, Manuel already had a long presentation about the transmission routes. I will not repeat this part. This is just one illustration how infected person can uh, contaminate the air and the surfaces very easily and all the room can be very easily contaminated if uh, uh, such an infected person will be in the room. So these uh, transmission routes just uh, to repeat is most important, so uh, clo close contact. If somebody is inhaling a droplet from infected person, then this is called this uh, close contact by large droplets, which are typically larger than 10 microns. Um, when these smaller droplets when actually these larger droplets will evaporate, called also as micro droplets or droplet nuclei. And um, when they are smaller than five microns, they stay airborne for a very long time. And this is uh, another potential uh, transmission route. When this uh, surface contact and uh, uh, fecal oral route are also important transmission routes. So uh, Manuel did a long presentation, what is the safe distance and does it exist? And uh, this figure you can see on the top, this just uh, confirms the previous one. You can see that um, uh, only very large droplets will settle down uh, quickly and within one, two meters distance. Then we will go to smaller ones. For example, this is actually marked with 20 microns, but initially, uh, before the evaporation, it is 40 microns. And this will spread until to four meters if we consider a typical very low air velocity in the room. And uh, for the five microns, there is almost no settling 
the position is very low and it stays airborne and can travel very long distances. So, so this means this is really a mix of uh, large and small droplets and uh, smaller ones uh, stay a very long time airborne. And this is the challenge with this uh, uh, transmission mechanism because uh, evidence is very limited actually for all of these transmission routes, also for the large droplets there are not too many studies uh, available where this evidence is provided. But we are getting more and more evidence that uh, these, um, this airborne transmission via these small micro droplets is an important mechanism and it has especially been associated with uh, so-called uh, super spreading events. And uh, what is associated typically for these events is that uh, these have happened in crowded spaces where ventilation has been very low. So I, I just will show a couple of examples. This is one uh, preprint, uh, so not yet published paper, but the paper what is under review and available uh, already. So, and this reports uh, situation from one Chinese uh, restaurant. You can see the index person here, uh, who was infected person, and then actually uh, in other other persons who were infected were sitting at the same table. So, just near this person, or for example here, or even at this table and also in this table. So altogether nine uh, persons were infected. And this case has been very well documented and has been studied. There is an air conditioner, as you can see. Air conditioner provides uh, just an air circulation and there is no outdoor air ventilation. Actually, Outdoor air ventilation is just provided from the restroom and it was very small, one liter per second per person. And in this case, one index pa patient infected nine persons. So this is somehow a typical case for such um, uh, super spreading events. And on the other hand, we have uh, quite good evidence from the hospital but there has been no infection risk at two meter distance. This is also one uh, published paper already, and uh, there was also measured what was CO2 concentration in these patient rooms. And from this concentration, it, it is uh, possible to estimate what was ventilation. As, as you can expect, modern hospitals are very well ventilated, so about 36 litres per second per person, and in this case, the two metres distance was, was a safe one. But you can see what's the difference between very small, poor ventilation and very high ventilation rate. Uh, so this is basically supporting that this airborne uh, Transmission is possible and more and more evidence is provided for that. Then we will go to the guidance RIFA has prepared. Uh, then it is also important to understand what's, um, what's a common infection control uh, measures. And according uh, to this uh, common list of measures, uh, elimination indeed is the most important part to eliminate, we would need to have a, a vaccine or medicaments available, which are not yet available right now. Uh, and we need still wait perhaps half of a year or something or, or that to get uh, these available. So far, number one measure would be engineering controls. So this actually will rise the ventilation as a number one infection control measure uh, currently, according to this classification. And then these administration measures will con uh, continue, and uh, uh, 
least effective measures are these personal protective equipment, uh, such as respirators and masks and, and so on. So this means that uh, if occupants are in normal building occupied spaces, then the ventilation is highly important also in this classification of the measures. So now I am going to these um, uh, recommendations and um, these basically are very simple ones and um, are prepared so that they can easily be applied in existing buildings without uh, bigger uh, changes needed. So first it is recommend, recommended to extend the operation time of the ventilation. So by changing just the clock times to start ventilation um, a bit earlier and um, keep a longer operation hours. And it is also recommended not to switch ventilation off at night and weekends, but to operate at, at lower speed. So extending ventilation operation, this will remove particles from air and also uh, those particles which are uh, released from the surfaces. So that's, that's uh, important to keep uh, ventilation in operation all the time. And uh, general advice is to supply as much as possible uh, outdoor air. So if building does not have adequate mechanical ventilation system, this will also mean the window opening, which can be used to boost the ventilation. So basically important aspect is the amount of fresh air per person. And indeed in indoor spaces, it's important to keep a distance. So uh, social distancing is important, but we need to speak in terms of physical distance. So two, three meters, uh, just a minimum one. And also exhaust ventilation in the toilets should be always kept on. So this needs to be operation 24 seven and uh, at full speed to avoid this possible uh, toilet transmission mechanism as well. Then uh, it has been discussed um, how important is um, or what is the role of humidity and temperature. Today we already know quite well what's the stability of this virus and it has been shown for example when you go to very high temperatures for example 56 degrees celsius for 30 minutes it will inactivate the virus but these indeed are not uh, uh, possible to reach in indoor spaces so in indoor spaces we know that the, this virus is very stable at uh, 65 percent of relative humidity so and uh, typical 21, 23 degrees. Uh, this has been tested in the laboratories. So uh, this is very strong evidence showing that basically we cannot do nothing. So there is no additional uh, help from the humidification or changing the temperature set points. So basically we just can say that air conditioning, uh, heating, and humidification, these do not have any practical effects in these uh, contexts. And our recommendation is not to change any set point in the HVAC systems. It does, uh, does not do anything. Uh, when indeed uh, we speak about ventilation and uh, it is important that the air will not be contaminated. And uh, if cross uh, carryover contamination can can happen in the systems because of uh, recirculation or because of a heat recovery when indeed this would be problematic and it is important that heat recovery equipment will operate so that this cross contamination will will not happen and uh, this, uh, this is also the case for the rotary heat exchanger, which basically can have some leakage. 
So the leakage rate, it always carries all the pollutants and uh, for the uh, correctly installed and operating equipment, a leakage rate should not be more than 2%. But if fans are on the same side and higher pressure is uh, created to the exhaust side, this can increase to 20%. So uh, basically the recommendation is to inspect what is the condition of these heat recovery equipments. And this carryover uh, leakage as the rotor is turning from exhaust extract air to supply air, there is evidence that uh, this does not transfer uh, particles but this transfer is limited to uh, gas-based pollutants, so it's more for the smells and tobacco smoke. Uh, and it, it is also known that this leakage in the rotor does not depend on the rotation speed, so basically if the equipment is operating correctly, there is no need to switch it down. Only recommendation we give is to inspect the condition of the equipment. And this is uh, one example, uh, one example of such heat recovery device. Uh, actually, there should be some arrows, uh, but you can see that on the supply side, uh, pressure is uh, is actually it is higher pressure compared to exhaust side. So basically. If correctly installed fans in the proper positions, when the pressure differences are from the supply side to the exhaust side, and also in this side, it is it is the same. And this is uh, how such rotary heat exchangers can be uh, safely operated. Um, then we already mentioned this re recirculation, and this is something what needs to be avoided. And in most of the systems uh, using recirculation, it is possible to switch these systems to 100% outdoor air. So just by closing uh, recirculation tampers and opening uh, uh, outdoor air tampers. So from the building management system or manually, uh, not a big operation. But there can be also some systems where this is, this is not possible and when indeed it is more uh, problematic. But basically, uh, this is the first recommendation not to use recirculation because recirculation will easily carry over all the pollutants and the filters applied in the extract site are not effective for the viruses because they are only for the protection of the equipment against the dust and do not have high efficiencies. Uh, when in some, some systems uh, we are using fan coils in the rooms or chill beams and basically this means room level circulation. It is also recommended to avoid this room level circulation or if not possible to switch off these devices when their fans are needed to be operated continuously because when we want to avoid that the virus can sediment in the filters and resuspension can happen when the fan is turned on. So basically two options, either to switch off or to keep uh, uh, fans continuously running to guarantee the airflow through these room circulating uh, units. Uh, then one of the last issues, uh, just to explain what is the meaning of uh, outdoor air filters and um, how we should think about uh, tuck cleaning. Is it necessary or not necessary? So basically outdoor air filters, they are not effective for very small particles and uh, this virus size is PM 0.1 micrometers and we know that the capture efficiency is about uh, perhaps 65 percent or something like that for one mic micrometer. So these filters certainly can catch some small particles but they are not intended for this size range 
and actually outdoor air is also not a source of viruses in uh, in common buildings so uh, basically outdoor air filters do not change anything in this situation and there is also no need to start to replace these uh, filters the same applies for the duct ductwork cleaning uh, when we can avoid this recirculation when uh, supply air ductwork will stay clean and no uh, special ductwork cleaning is needed uh, what can be useful in the rooms are these uh, air cleaners but they need to have HEPA filter efficiency so uh, high efficiency filters uh, or electrostatic filtration is also effective uh, but indeed these air cleaners are typically uh, can serve only small area and small rooms so typically less than 10 square meters and should be located close to the breathing zone when these can be can be useful uh, what is important uh, when we speak about the maintenance or some scheduled maintenance or duct cleaning or filter replacement when maintenance personnel needs to be to be protected so that they uh, have respiratory protection and and so on this is something what needs to be taken into account well to summarize uh, these uh, issues are listed as 14 points in our recommendations i i will not start to repeat all of these uh, but this is a short list what is important what needs to be done and what should not be planned during this outbreak uh, period and uh, this is the list of uh, rifa uh, task force preparing this um, guidance so thank you very much Hello, good noon to everyone. I'm pleased to be here on the behalf of ICAR to show what kind of activity ICAR has performed to try to give an answer, practical answer to all technicians working in the field of air conditioning and mainly air conditioning manager to reduce the risk of diffusion of SARS-CoV-2. Then uh, in this time, uh, ICAR has produced up to five documents. The first was uh, in March, the end of March, uh, short position paper, similar to the RIVA document. You already seen something about, but then has been produced at the same time a protocol we are going to see. That means uh, a practical aid to of a to manage in correct way uh, existing air conditioning and ventilation system because the problem is the emergency and uh, we are not going to design today a new perfect system we are trying to use what we have and mainly when we have old not well designed system we can have problem then in beginning of april a second position paper has been uh, uh, produced uh, and uh, uh, the 10th of uh, April, we have produced a protocol for risk reduction in healthcare facilities. The first protocol uh, is only uh, limited to other destination, uh, residential offices, uh, shops, and so on, because healthcare facilities is a special uh, situation, mainly because there was a uh, there is adaptation of different kind of building to host uh, healthcare facilities uh, and so on and then there was another document uh, uh, just uh, an explanation of uh, the first protocol for risk production now going ahead we will look a combination of the protocol and this is a further explanation here it is the protocol uh, what is very important to stress is that the starting point is we are dealing with existing system and how we can reduce the this the uh, risk 
or uh, infection uh, diffusion in existing building in real situation. Then the starting point is that uh, ventilation, as already stressed by the other colleague, is uh, one of the way to reduce the infection risk, diluting the uh, pollutant, in this case, diluting the virus if any virus is in the air inside. And what you can see uh, here, we have uh, an uh, a block diagram uh, with the starting position and look at what kind of system you have. And then, for instance, if you have a, an all air system, uh, you can go down, yes. Then uh, uh, you have to see how many zones uh, is going to be served by this all air system, several or only a single zone. If it's a single zone, the suggested intervention are the same as you can have for all other system. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, primary air and uh, terminals uh, or only local system and so on. And then you can see here you have some circle with numbers, one, two, three, four, five. If you go down here, you see what kind of suggested intervention they describe. One is increase airflow, two is force dampers to introduce uh, outdoor air only, that means close recirculation path. Uh, three, the activation or bypass of heat recovery unit uh, when there is a risk of leakage, as you have understood, a crossover or leakage effect through the heat recovery units. Uh, we also say that we have to keep relative humidity at least 40 or can be 30 percent. It's not due to virus viability, but it's due to that uh, uh, mucus resistance to uh, virus attack is high if they are not dry. If we have dry uh, mucus, we are uh, more subject to any possible virus attack. Then, of course, here, ventilation, continuous ventilation, if it's achievable and possible. And then if you go down, if several zone, you see you have to look uh, if you uh, plan to have or not recirculation, what recirculation type typology you have. And then if you have centralized situation or local uh, recirculation, different kind of suggestion. They are reported here and uh, explained much better in the next slide we will see. Also on the right, you see green, yellow, and red uh, circle, different kind of intervention. The green is a version that requires action on the control system only. Uh, there you can do uh, via control system, uh, computer room, and so on. Instead, the yellow intervention that requires maintenance staff action. Some guy has to go on the system and to change manually something. Instead, the red intervention that require may require plant modification, that is uh, much difficult to achieve. If we go ahead, you can see here you now in detail what does mean increase I flow, I flow can be done increasing the fan speed uh, through inverter. If you have an inverter in managing the, the motor, instead, if you have a bell and pulley, you can change the diameter of the pulley to change the uh, speed, the rotating speed of the fan. Of course, this is limited to the maximum power the electrical motor can, can, can reach without having problem and so on. Force damper to introduce outdoor air, yes, some scheme showing what you can have in practice uh, in all air circulation system or in primary air with room or zone uh, uh, units, and then uh, what kind of uh, uh, action you can, you can do. Uh, according to the the activation of heat recovery unit, we are a bit more strong than uh, RIVA is in the way that we, uh, to be on the safety side, because of we are talking mainly on all system, you never know exactly what you have there. Uh, it's just the first aid, let's say, uh, action. Then uh, just try to bypass and close everything. 
and not only for the rotary exchanger, but also our membrane based entropy exchanger, where the performance, uh, the, the transmission of particles uh, between the two streams depend on the performance of the membrane. And then if you don't have any clear uh say certificate from the factory saying that your membrane is sure according to the virus transmission then it's better to bypass this uh, exchanger then uh, <clears throat> if we just uh, go fast over this is the extension has been done to simplify still uh, what normally you can do looking on your real system you have uh, for managers. Then, for instance, uh, if you have other rooms, uh, you have to distinguish if you have mechanical ventilation or not. Uh, if you don't have what system type you have, single room, uh, uh, then first case, single room without any mechanical ventilation, what you can do is just open the window because you can do any, any other action. As emergency action, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm saying I'm not redesign the system. Then, instead, if you have mechanical ventilation, of course, increase the outdoor flow rate as much as possible. There is a possibility of cross contamination. What I mean with cross contamination will be clear with some scheme coming later. That if you can transfer the virus from one room to another room, till you have only just ventilation you cannot have uh, cross-contamination and then uh, uh, you can have reduction of the um, system impact on the risk is giving a, a risk reduction the performance doesn't change in both cases and so on for different kind of application restaurants bars shops supermarket looking at what kind of system typically you have of course this is not uh, a bible cannot have all uh, system possibility combination are just the main most usual going on the second slide we just wait a bit i would like to stress that here i made a mistake on the label is not again restaurant bar shops but now is offices okay offices and it's the same situation you can have mechanical ventilation yes or not then uh, system type uh, uh, single room or several rooms system uh, if you have ventilator if you have ventil mechanical ventilation this can be undone separately or through a multi-zone air or air system then you can see if you have or not possible virus cross contamination what's the impact uh, you can have case in which you increase uh, the risk uh, because you can have cross contamination uh, and change system performance or not but will be more interesting to have a look to the uh, schematics here and uh, this is for instance uh, a network let's say heating cooling system uh, without ventilation then you have two rooms terminals in each room and in this case you have local recirculation and then till you have uh, not open space as a room one not open space as a room two room two there is no problem about the recirculation inside each room and there is no cross contamination still till you don't open large door and you leave open the door between the two uh, spaces then no cross contamination no virus dilution instead if you have uh, an unique uh, and the unique working uh, full uh, recirculation this is the worst condition you can have because you just remix all the air and if you have an infected person in room one you can uh, transport because we're learning we can have an airborne virus production and distribution and then you can uh, distribute the virus in room two with less concentration, but still there is virus there. Then you have cost contamination and no virus dilution, then the worst situation you can have. If you have a C is just a mechanical ventilation system, mechanical ventilation system doesn't provide any control on the air temperature and the humidity in the room, but is providing ventilation, that means outdoor air is coming in. Then what do you have? Virus dilution and you don't have normally cross-contamination because 
then if it's correct, well designed, of course, you have separate extraction of the exhaust air, which is taken out to the outside without uh, any possible red circulation. And then finally, the all air HVA system. Then uh, the point is, uh, this is uh, like ventilation, but with control of temperature and humidity. But then what you have to do, the normally they are designed to save energy, to have a recirculation damper. And in that case, to avoid the possible cross-contamination, you have to close the recirculation damper. In that way, for the from the point of view of outdoor there is working exactly as a, a simple ventilation unit, well designed and correctly designed. Then <clears throat> this is just instead a single or eight zone, single zone all air HVAC system. In this case, again, what you have here is uh, that you have to absolutely close uh, the a circulation damper because you cannot avoid that there is some movement of air inside the room and then if there is an infected person in one position some of the let's say of the airborne virus can be carried through the space till the extra air position outlet or inlet position this is not possible to avoid. The only thing you can do is just to dilute as much as possible with as much as possible outdoor air to have very low charge, very low concentration of the viruses in the flowing air before it to be uh, taken out from the room. Now, as I said before, we have developed a protocol also for the uh, healthcare facilities, uh, mainly looking at the problem also of the new situation is built exactly as uh, it was uh, it was uh, uh, for the it was for the other uh, protocol i will not then go through because there is no time you have as a reference but the main point here is that for uh, we have to look what kind of uh, um, activity you have inside your healthcare facility. If you have intensive care unit uh, for infected people, should be, uh, as we say normally, in negative pressure. And then everything has to be uh, accordingly uh, realized. Then you have the situation when you are going to adapt other spaces not built for infected people care. And uh, then you have more clear schematics how you can work to adapt some uh, space which was not from the beginning designed for uh, such situation in the way that can work correctly reducing the risk of diffusion and the last scheme you can see uh, on the bottom here is uh, what has been built in the fair of milan using a fair all just to uh, built inside a COVID intensive care units, controlling the indoor climate with the standard existing and unit, uh, let's say full air unit, and then having the de dedicated unit, ventilation unit for the COVID space to have up to uh, le not less than 12 air change rate inside the, the boxes uh, where the intensive care unit is. And taking under negative pressure. I think we the time is over. Then I say thanks to all of you for your attention. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, now we we'll go a bit less technical and more about how to include people. So we've been working for less, almost four years uh, on the Horizon 2020 project named MobiStyle, where we talk about energy use, indoor environment quality, and using health as a motivating factor. Now, uh, obviously, the health became the main motivating factor recently, so we'll try to share some insights or some 
uh, things that we learned in the past years. First, what we wanted to do is to change the paradigm. If you read the articles in Europe, we always they always start with 40% of final energy is consumed by buildings. We said, no, it's different. People use energy. So uh, this changes the perspective. Of course, we need all the technical systems and everything, but on the end, people use energy to fulfill our needs, to do, to get work done, etc. Or, of course, to sustain healthy, productive indoor environment. This changes things a bit. Uh, putting user or the person in the center or of this building ecosystem uh, means we need to take them into account always. We know that the buildings are meant to ensure comfort for the users. We have dynamic buildings that are able to respond to environment, to user needs. All this is, of course, in terms of energy optimization because we need or we want as low energy use as possible. But on the end, it's people who are using building systems and interacting with them. So in MobiStyle, we wanted to know how we can influence the use of buildings. These are just a few simple examples. We started with a multi-channel campaign stimulating stairs use instead of the elevators. These are results of two years uh, campaign, one year baseline, one year monitoring. And yes, all the elevators in faculty building in Ljubljana uh, decreased the use because we used health, which is really simple to associate stair use instead of elevator with health. The energy savings are minor. But we try to change behavior one step at a time. So stair use is just a simple example. This one was not decreased because this is kitchen and it's not used by the building users it's just to supply goods to the kitchen. Other example is opening windows. We heard in previous presentations that it's important to open win windows and these are examples for rooms that are not mechanically ventilated. So we had several campaigns from ICT tools to physical interventions to influence people to open windows more. And we succeeded. People opened windows more, but we uh, we are now in the uh, measurement evaluation phase and we are not certain that the indoor air quality or indoor environment was improved. But we know that the windows were opened more. We are using several methods to stimulate people opening windows. One was sensor like this that changed color of this LED based on CO2 and VOC concentrations. We had encounter of a user that said he does not trust the sensor. So this is, I'm showing this to show why only measurements are not enough. We need to understand the context because our building are real environments and they, we don't, do not have controlled experiments like we have in the lab. What was late, because this was interesting, of course, sensors can, can fail but we made the inquiry by a focus group and found out that they put gowns they used in a organic chemistry lab next to a sensor and most likely the evaporating compounds the chemicals influence the sensor so it's really important when we try to interpret the data in real life conditions to also to understand the people the behaviors we do this with so-called people-centered development approach. Uh, we applied this approach in Mobistar project from the very beginning. We start with the first step, which is identification. We need to know who are we solving for. So uh, what are the products and solutions who are ad addressed at? We ask people using various ethnographic research methods from the interviews, focus groups, uh, shadowing, and so on, to understand what do people want and need. Then we interpret this in the way that developers, in our example, these were ICT developers developing several tools, 
they need to understand what people want because people can talk about functionalities or they can maybe imagine what they would need but need, this needs to be translated in a meaningful recommendations for the ICT developers when we have solutions we need to test them with the same people again these are examples of solutions I'll talk about later important thing is that we keep the loop so when we we ask people we analyze we interpret it when we do the testing we show them solutions and we ask them again and we circle this using various met methods such as prototypes scenarios and again focus groups on the end it sounds really simple it just means talking with your people it needs to be in a structured way you need to know what to ask them and need to document it and use this the important is the translation between humanities or what people need and to the developers in mobi style we did a lot of these uh, solutions and here are the links and the website where all this uh, is available we also had a build-up webinar where the methodology uh, how to how we came to the mobi style icd tools was presented here just a glimpse about the mobi style system we did uh, we take data from sensors in homes in public buildings uh, in private offices uh, in hotels and put it in a database and then we developed several tools that are using this data and showing it to the users trying to influence their habits and behaviors one example is the mobi style game that is deployed in hundreds of homes in poland and in social housing in denmark we use gamification principles so that the, the game itself is more interesting we have sensors in homes uh, when the windows are opened the energy use the co2 temperature humidity and so on and this is used to create scenarios to nudge behavior in a let's say more healthy uh, way dashboard and the app was developed and deployed in a hotel environment in italy and university buildings in slovenia uh, this is intended uh, more for building managers uh, where they can set uh, let's say notifications to be sent to users for example co2 in my room is too high and then i get a notification a push notification on my mobile phone to open the window to put it simple there are several different ones for the office environment the dutch partner Huygen developed uh, office app stimulating dynamic indoor condition because uh, so-called temperature training being exposed to very uh, not being exposed to not fixed temperature profile in the office is proven to be healthier so uh, and also voting on indoor environment quality was or is stimulated with this app uh, all the information is available on the links that you will get in the presentation later last tool was intend is intended for the experts uh, it's a mobile style expert tool where you can calculate several um, performance indicators and do the data management of the all demo sites which are very different uh, with different systems and there was a lot of work necessary to get the data from let's say io2 wireless devices in homes to scada measurements in large buildings and put all this into one um, database to be useful for other applications but then of course the crisis the current crisis came and we were thinking what we can do so mobistyle initiated a campaign to show also other people who are stuck at home now how to do this let's say people friendly communication the main point is to communicate what we are doing meaning start uh, staying energy efficient uh, staying healthy as a main uh, pillar now and also productive working from home so together with three other projects we started the campaign hero at home uh, here the advices are shared regularly by all four projects uh, what we can do but it's important to be here at home but to be even more important when the lockdown is over or uh, will be less strict 
but we'll be also heroes at work. So, to conclude, what we learned in Mobi style BC before Corona, it was really hard, difficult to change habits. That's why we employed anthropologists who know people uh, to understand the rituals, the habits. Um, but we put a lot of effort, different campaigns, many actions, tools, uh, but the habits change was minor, let's say. Uh, we used uh, health as a trigger because uh, everybody, even before Corona, everybody wanted to be healthy. And we thought this might be a good path to initiate uh, changed building hues. What we need to keep in mind now, and something I would like to share with you to take away is now it's been quite a few weeks and the buildings are closed. And when we come back to the to work, to public buildings, to private offices, uh, new habits will be formed. They will be formed in uh, main reason will be the sanitary the new sanitary demands, like washing hands, disinfecting, uh, masks, social distancing, and, and so on. This is very similar as when you open a new building. When people employ it, uh, when people occupy it, uh, the new habits, the rituals, everything is formed. And this is now the perfect time. So if we communicate well to the building users coming now to these new environments, we can have a lower energy use while improving indoor environment quality, resulting in better productivity. And yes, health uh, is becoming uh, a new wealth. We are talking about this even before Corona, but now this is really the key. Uh, it's up to us. Uh, we can choose to make uh, new habits but not just in respect to the COVID-19, but in respect to climate change and biodiversity loss we are facing. Uh, so we saw now how in time when a de governmental decree comes, we can change ha habits immediately. Everything changed. Uh, the climate change is, is worse threat than this, and we should change our lifestyles immediately not to wait for the decrease because otherwise it might be too late so thank you uh, thank you very much um, we received uh, a long list of questions so let's try to go through some of them um, so um, is FFP1 mask sufficient or we need FFP2 or FFP3 mask? If you use, also another question, if you use a mask and let it outside for 72 hours, is it safe to use it again? So anyone could ask, can answer. May I ask if you wish? The point is that uh, uh, F1 F11, uh, FF1 or FF2 or 3 are a different uh, uh, usage. That means the so called allergical mask, uh, number one, we can say, that's uh, it's a mask which is helping the others, not ourselves. That means uh, it's uh, avoiding that uh, our virus can be spread out in face of other people when we laugh and so on. That means uh, it's protecting the environment, it's protecting the community, uh, while FP, uh, FFP3 uh, mask, uh, the strongest one, has to be used on, on only uh, from medical operator because then it's avoiding to inhale the virus from the outside when breathing. Uh, while they are not protecting on the other way around, mainly if they have valves. Because if they have valves, that means the medical operator is going to exhalate everything without any filter. In fact, sometimes you can see that they wear two masks, one over the other. So-called chirurgical mask, the FFP1, to avoid that they spread out, and over this, the P3 to avoid to 
inhalate some virus from the environment when they are working with a, a infected person. Then the point is, for the future, what we call phase two, it's uh, enough to wear so-called chirurgical mask type one to be safety in respect to the other. Because the main point that a lot of people doesn't know to be positive because they are asymptomatic and they can instead infect other peoples. In that way, keeping the social distance and wearing the chirurgical mask, they are okay. The point is about the change in the mask. Again, depends. For operators in, uh, in infected wards, they have to change each four hours. Okay, and they have to throw away this mask because it's probably uh, they have a lot of virus on the mask itself. It's completely different on the other way around. We are talking about chirurgical mask, but first of all, you can in the future or near today probably you can easily find them. Uh, by law now, the price in Italy has been fixed of so 0.3 cents of euro each. And we are able to produce what we need inland. Then uh, uh, the problem is that some material cannot be washed, for instance, they destroy itself. Some material can be, but then you have to look at exactly what kind of mask you are dealing with and how long you need the protection. Uh, Liv, you may I? Just yeah, you, you have. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think because it's not only a question of washing, I think the mask may be ironed or even maybe sterilize it with ultraviolet light during some, uh, some period. And uh, there is another issue I would like, okay, the, the choice of the mask depends very much on the uh, uh, viral load that we are expecting to be exposed. So uh, it's completely different to be working in a hospital or to be uh, uh, going to a supermarket in terms of the, the viral uh, load. And uh, okay, surgical masks are not protecting us uh, completely, but anyway, uh, having some uh, obstruction to the uh, penetration of the virus is always better than having nothing. And what I would like to mention is also the possibility of using a mask combined with a face shield. Because if we have two protective uh, de uh, uh, devices in sequence, the probability is like we have one probability uh, as a failure for one of the systems and one probability of failure for the other. And so the probability of failure for the set is multiple, we multiply one by the other. So having two different protective uh, devices is, uh, let us say, a few times much better than uh, having only one. Okay, thank you. So let's go on with another question. Um, the use of ozone sanitizer into the open spaces or rooms can be considered uh, as a way to disinfect. disinfect. And the, the ozone, UV lamps. Ozone is a, is a pollutant for indoor air. So in case we are breathing ozone, we will have some problems with uh, our uh, respiratory system. So because it uh, we will have like asthma, irritation, and, and so on. Ozone can be only used for uh, exhausting, exhaust air, not for air being breathed by people. Okay, good point. And what about the use of UV lamps? Uh, it is uh, in, it, it is UVC, but uh, of course it uh, will like, uh, uh reduce the viral load but 
people should not be exposed uh, to the to this type of light. It can be. Question, uh, yeah, sorry. The main question is that uh, it should be correctly designed, correct installed, correct and managed. Because if you have too few power, is placed in the wrong position, probably doesn't work. Then uh, it's not something you can just buy, plug in, and say, okay, I'm safety. No. Okay, so let's go with another question. This uh, this is for um, Yarek. Are chilled beams a risk for spreading the virus as they circulate indoor air? How does the risk associated to chilled beams differ from fan coils? Uh, so, in the case of uh, chilled beams, uh, there is um, always a circulation as they are connected to the ventilation system. This is induced by uh, ventilation supply air. And the only thing what you can do is to keep um, ventilation all the time in operation. So, what was the recommendation that um, during the night time and weekends, it's not recommended to switch ventilation off, but operate at lower speed. And this will avoid the risk of the circulation from chill beams. So compared to fan coils, fan coils uh, are using a separate fan uh, to uh, have a circulation, and they also have a filter. So it's possible that in the filter something will uh, sediment, and this is additional feature. But basically, the strategy is same: you can switch off the fan coil, or you can keep the fan continuously running. So from that point of view, there is no difference between chill beam and fan coil. May I add something? Uh, I agree with Yarek, but the other point is what kind of space is served? Because if you have a single office with only one person, it's not a problem at all if you have local recirculation for any kind of system. The problem is only if you have a large open space, okay, where you have several people, and then uh, you can have a, a positive asymptomatic guy sitting somewhere which can be who can be a source of uh, let's say a virus spread virus spread in that case any kind any kind of circulation without outdoor air is a risk small risk but it could be a risk then uh, it's not system dependent uh, because you can also have with uh, opening the window without any system that one guy is sitting just uh, nearby the window and then it's coughing and then it's distributing with the eye stream coming in virus uh, in all the space okay let's move on with another question is there any ratio of fresh air, of fresh uh, um, air by person for example 100 percent fresh air is not exactly the same for whole buildings Maybe it means around three changes by hour or even 10 changes by hour in others. What is the recommendation? Uh, so um, the recommendation to have 100% fresh air means that it needs to be outdoor air ventilation we are speaking about and to avoid this recirculation. So, uh, but there is no exact evidence how much ventilation is needed to reduce the infection risk. Uh, there are many studies ongoing, but uh, this information is currently not available. And we only can estimate that uh, to fulfill national requirements or the values what are in the European standards is highly recommended. So to fill, fulfill uh, current code or standard requirements, that's, that's the first point. And these typically lead to uh, about 10 liter per second per person ventilation, which is in, in current standards. Maybe uh, to reduce the risk of infection, even higher ventilation rates would be needed. So uh, 10 liter per second per person is around uh, uh, two air changes per hour. Uh, typically two, three air changes per hour can be seen as some sort of uh, 
minimum ventilation what is useful uh, to reduce the risk of uh, uh, infection. But uh, I, I need to repeat that there is no good evidence yet. These are just an estimations. We are, we are waiting to get the scientific information and then this uh, uh, question can be answered maybe one year later when such information would be available. And, uh, I would like to add something. It's, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, the, the 10 liters per second, or like uh, 36 cubic meter per hour, it's uh, what we have in most of the uh, standards. But uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, the, let us say, the concentration of virus that we need to infect a person depends also on the health condition of the of person. So if we have sensible risk, sensible people uh, like uh, elderly people, for instance, and we know that we had a, a very uh, big problems with uh, these houses, with uh, uh, like resting houses for uh, elderly people. In that case, I think that uh, we should increase uh, what we have in, in standards because uh, the risk in principle will be higher and the infection may occur uh, with a lower concentration of the virus because uh, what we know nowadays is that the receptors for the virus in the cells uh, the number of receptors increase with age so uh, my suggestion is in this type of uh, buildings and facilities uh, it's like use uh, we have the, the European standard and the European standard uh, 167981 uh, it has a class A in class, in class A we need more ventilation and so my suggestion is to apply it the, the increase the ventilation uh, in places with sensible people if you like to have a number we can give a number just for special situation. W, uh, the World Center Organization, is giving a number for the infective ward. For infective ward, where you have the highest concentration of virus production, then they are talking about 36 R change rate. We designed our intensive care unit for COVID with 12 air change rate. Just to give an idea, but this is where you have up to six, 12 people infected strongly. Very strong source. Thank you for this reference. Um, um, I will ask another question, which I think will be the last one. Um, will HEPA, so high efficiency particulate air filters in airplanes, stop virus particles? I, I can ask what it is. Yes, high efficiency particulate filters, they will stop because the efficiency is 99.97. Uh, so this is actually the filter needed to have also in air cleaners to be effective. They, in, in this respect, they filtrate all particles, including virus-laden particles. These are very effective, yes. Yeah, yeah the, the only point we have to stress, Jarek, is that uh, if you don't have an air only unit uh, which has been built to use such a kind of filter, you cannot put these filters on a standard uh, air only unit because then you will have a leakage uh, on the connection point and then the filter will be bypassed. Then take care that your unit has to be able to use such filters. Yes, this is true, because these filters have much higher pressure drop compared to conventional filters. So it's not just a replacement. It is not yeah. so easy. But in special situations, it can be can be considered and uh, absolutely uh, some sort of remodeling work. Then, uh, just uh, a remark here in Portugal, to be used in some uh, old hospitals, uh, some uh, units with 
so it's air cleaners with the epa filter were were de developed and uh, i think they are uh, having a, a good contribution so it's not something to put on the system but it's like a air cleaner that can be moved from one place to the uh, to the other uh, of course very special care will be needed when removing the the filters yeah, from these units uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we ran out ran out of time. Um, there are a lot, uh, many questions still to be answered. About I'm sure um, you, the people can contact you and ask you directly. Um, so I would like to thank all our panelists for the presentations today and uh, for the interest uh, of our audience. So thank you. Okay, and. Uh... In the on behalf of the River Board, thank you very much to build up for uh, organi organizing this this event, which was I think uh, quite important in this phase. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.